Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you firstly for Fuel 50 for actually uh, letting me come over. It is a bit early for me. I'm from Perth time, so maybe now I've done well, I think. Um, I feel I've already done my presentation because the speed dating, I feel like I gave at least 10 people the presentation already. But uh, if I do double up, please bear with me for those who to hear um, our story. So um, I really want to talk about, I suppose, our journey from an organisation perspective. Um, being from Perth, probably not many people will uh, be familiar with our organisation. So in, in essence, what I'm going to try and do today is talk about how Field 50 was fairly instrumental and how we transformed the ways we work not just from a business perspective, but also from a HR perspective, but also really driven around the employee experience, which was something fairly new and dynamic for us. Um, and something that we hadn't really experienced before in our organisation. Uh, as you can see, probably going to focus on these areas. The, probably the significance of those images on there is that we were pretty old school, pretty traditional. Um, so hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll see those images have changed a little bit around how we've actually driven I suppose the transformation within our organisation and the benefit that it's had from an engagement and experience and I suppose a capability perspective in our organisation. I think uh, we all are familiar with the fact that technology is driving so many changes so rapidly and creating so much disruption. A bit of um, touching on the point that Anne would make around that human touch as well. So I thought it was quite interesting just to view some fun facts. It's always interesting after morning tea. There is a bit of sugar in the people. I'm not going to do speed dating. There's going to be no dancing, so that's all good. But I thought we'd just kind of give a bit of insight into some of the interesting facts that we have around technology that may surprise or will be familiar to some of you. So as you can see, the first couple will really talk about just that propensity for people to use technology and how it's changing very quickly um, uh, over time within organisations and in life. Um, we I found that one quite interesting. Approximately 12 hours a day, we're looking at some sort of screen. Who's looking at their phone right now? No, I just want to check. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you're tweeting to FuelX, that's fine. There you go. I've got it in. Um, Anne also talked about the, 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 the workforce mobility, I suppose, which is really interesting. We start to see that effectively they're saying that a billion, dollar, a billion people will actually leave their fixed desks behind. So what does that create around a ways of working from an organisation perspective? Now, Hands up in this room, whoever in their life has had a play a Nintendo, an Atari, a Wii, or those things. It's all right, you're awesome. <laughs> now, who would have thought that that then turned into, in our sector, a gambling opportunity? <laughs> well, guess what it has? And it's amazing just the dynamic nature of where gambling and sport and entertainment is actually driven. The reason that that's become such a um, driver, I suppose, of um, uh, wagering is the fact that it's such a big industry that they had to diversify different ways. And you can see these days, I don't know if you've read, and I'm not a gamer, just putting it out there, um, but they have stadiums where they get 70 or 80,000 people where people can win up to a million dollars, which is just unfounded. I've never thought, if I knew that was the case when I was 10, I swear I would have been not probably standing up here and probably doing something else around gaming. So I, I suppose I just put this up there as a way of just really enforce, uh, reminding us just around how, whether we like it or not, we're being influenced by technology and how it faces from both the usage and the ways of working. Um, I was pretty happy that I found a colleague or someone from here that actually does actually know who Racing and Wagering WA is, so that was quite pleasing. Um, we have an issue of brand identity in our own um, Western Australia. So I suppose what I'll do is give you a bit of a context of who we are and some of our challenges to understand how we then used, I suppose, how Fuel 50 was pretty instrumental in starting our journey around what I call the digital ecosystem. So um, it's a bit of a tongue twister, so I'm just going to say RALA rather than keep saying Racing and Wagering WA. Um, we're a medium-sized workforce, 500 employees. Basically, we have two arms. We have the wagering arm, which would be referred as the TAB. Now, I know on the East Coast, it's the green TAB. On the, our side, it's the purple TAB. And then we have the racing industry, which we're um, responsible for. So thoroughbreds, standard breeds, so harness and greyhounds. It's quite unique. There's no other um, uh, organisation that's set up that way in Australia. I think New Zealand might be fairly similar. Um, we, the racing industry itself is the third last third largest employment sector in WA, so it's a pretty big sector behind retail and I think health industry. Um, we're a fairly profitable organisation, we generate about $2 billion a year, we have no personal debt and effectively our purpose is around basically providing for the sustainability of the racing industry. So generally we will um, put anywhere between 150 to 200 million back into the industry of racing. That's our purpose. Um, 
from a, I suppose, a, an organisation perspective, from a turnover retention, we, we've been pretty fortunate over the time I've been here, which has been over 11 years, we typically sit around 5 to 10% turnover permanent, which is quite a nice, um, stable workforce. I'm always a big believer that turnover is healthy as long as it's the right turnover. Um, but we've had a fairly successful business model. But it doesn't mean we don't have challenges. So we've had some pretty big challenges and some more recent that you'd probably be fairly familiar with. So um, the relevance of racing as a sport has changed over 30 years. 30 years ago you get, I'm just talking about WA, I know it's a bit different on the east coast now, you get anywhere between 15 and 20,000 piece of people to a racetrack. It was very family, very traditional. Now you're competing with basketball, football, that's only an hour, two hours time, whereas racing it's 40 minutes, run a race, break, run a race, run a race, etc. So the relevance of racing has definitely changed as a destination point for individual or for the community. Um, it's a highly competitive industry, as you can see by the brands up there on the top right hand corner or top left hand corner. I think it's globally one of the fifth in the top five for global, uh, sorry, competitive industries from a wagering perspective in the world. So there's no customer loyalty. Now, I'm not going to ask you to own up how many tab accounts you've got on your phones or anything like that, um, but you'll generally find there's anywhere between three or four. Customers are not loyal in this space. It's all about who's going to give you the best buyback or best incentive. So when you think about that from a, from a driving a revenue perspective, and those other providers are pretty big in the industry, so their, their marketing will be, you know, 10, 20 size the spend that we will. We're competing in a fairly um, dynamic industry. Uh, Welfare, so obviously most of you I'm guessing have heard about the issues we've had around thoroughbred up in the recent incident up in Queensland. And whilst WA wasn't affected, you are affected, you're associated whether you like it or not. So there's a community sentiment around um, racing and the competitive nature of races and then the horses are no longer used. Um, it's kind of almost like an expendable commodity. And two years ago we had the greyhound industry under uproars around the live baiting. So even when you think about gambling itself around the social um, reference and impact of that. It creates some very interesting challenges around how do you actually positively promote your brand in a way that's seen for the right reasons rather than necessarily the, the wrong reasons. The biggest challenge we've had though, which is probably more about the stories, the last three or four years, um, we've been under the threat of privatisation as an organisation. So with uniqueness, I talked about that model, puts you at risk as well. Um, where the ultimately owned by the government, <clears throat> we don't act like a government, we're commercial, but the government owns it and has decided over that period of time that they don't want to be associated with a gambling organisation, if I kind of put in those words. So that's created a really interesting challenge, as you can probably appreciate for those who have probably been through that, um, from a people and culture space over three years. You know, I think as the executive we talked about, we, we should I just say sell it or don't sell it, because then we can, unless we know we've got an outcome and we can go there, we said the last thing we wanted is this indecision, which we've had for three or four years. So that's definitely created um, for us a lot of challenges. How do you keep a workforce engaged? Um, how do you keep a workforce productive when we all know what we feel, what happens when we find out potentially you might have a job, but we don't know whether that's today, tomorrow or next year or the year after. So for us, it was pretty important for us as an organisation to be clear with our business around what are the key um, drivers for business performance. We wanted to keep our workforce engaged in some way. And at a very high level, we basically came up with three principles around customer experience, employee experience, and ways of working. What was really pleasing around the employee experience was that it was identified by the executive team. That was probably the most critical piece for us in ensuring our business still delivered what it needed to deliver. And the reason we had to keep that into consideration is what if it didn't sell? It's a bit like when you go and buy a house. You're looking to buy a house. Do you think this, it's for sale for two million? You want to pay 1.5. That's the space we're in at the moment. So we couldn't afford, we can't afford as a business to actually wait for a potential outcome and then be another two years behind in regards to the, the, the I suppose, the competitive industry that we're actually in. So employee experience was deemed as one of the critical pieces. Um, and as you can see at a high level there, we focused on four pillars around inclusion, diversity, recruitment, onboarding, wellbeing, and learning and capability. It was also a significant change for us to actually focus on the ex employee experience, which Joe talked about at the start. Um, where our focus had traditionally been more on engagement. Uh, hang on. Okay. Um, it'd been more on engagement. So, you know, the typical sort of engagement where you have a measure at 12 months, you get some feedback, you try and deal with that in six months' time, it's too late, the impact's already happened, and you start the cycle over again. 
Whereas we understood from the research and I suppose um, lessons learned from even us, us using some of our technology that the employee experience was probably the most critical area that we needed to start focusing on. And for us, engagement was more the outcome rather than the driver. We work on all the things that actually in, in, um, engage, improve, uh, enhance an employee's experience, whether it's personalised, whether it's meaningful, whether it's around career aspirations. The outcome should be you've got a more engaged workforce. So that was quite a substantial change for us. Um, and some interesting research was around that, you know, in 2009, which I suppose was kind of evidenced by that quote in the sense of just the importance HR leaders saw around the importance of the employee experience. I must admit, I hadn't really kind of considered employee experience. It was kind of like, what's that? And everyone had a different terminology and vice versa. So I think for, um, from my learnings, I'd say that you make it what it's, what it's relevant for your area or your business. We also had learnt through previous um, attempts, and I would say reasonably unsuccessful attempts around how we use technology in HR for the wider business that we still knew it was important. Um, you know, for us it was around how we could use technology to drive a fairly positive employee experience. So is that a way around the use of technology, around their first day, um, around the type of technology or tools they had access to? We knew that it actually didn't improve employee engagement, but we didn't know what the measures were before that to actually drive that. Um, we talked about that speed of economy and about how we use our phones all the time. So trying to tap into that micro learning where people typically are learning on the phone, sorry, on the bus when they're going to work or on the train, vice versa. How do we actually create that kind of learning capability and um, opportunities? But for us, it was very much around um, how you actually take a more proactive approach. If you think about the fact that we're under uncertainty in privatisation, we ran the risk of we did an engagement survey every 12 months that. We could have had half the organisation killing each other at the water cooler around all the issues that have been playing out from a business perspective. So we knew that we had to actually change the dynamic around how we actually got feedback. Um, when I was at school, I actually wanted to be in accountant, so I love analytics. So it was kind of like, this is kind of the, the world that I actually wanted to be in. So we knew that we actually had to do it. Um, for us, it was then around how do we do that? Um, Digital ecosystem, whilst it's a word, it probably wasn't where we're saying we need to build a digital ecosystem. It wasn't kind of like our mandate. It was about how we look at, I suppose, the key um, functions and responsibilities or processes that we have from a HR perspective or people perspective and how we actually use technology to kind of either enhance that. The challenge we also had is that there's a lot of literature out there that says, you know, try and look at one, one product to kind of capture all your needs because you don't want, people don't want to go through five different systems. The challenge we had is that whenever we looked at technology, and we had some um, experiences of that, is that we never, we never could go to the Lamborghini version because we knew this wouldn't resonate and it probably wasn't suitable for our process. So it was about how you can actually use intricate pieces in, in a way that was kind of seamless from a user experience, but also ensured that we actually got the value out of each of those products in a different way. So that was something quite unique for us. Um, I mean, the definition of an ecosystem, digital ecosystem, is a platform that basically each independent people, companies can use for some sort of benefit. I suppose it was almost like for us, the digital ecosystem was the outcome rather than us actually focusing on it um, through the process. So when we started talking about, you know, how do we start reshaping about our principles around employee experience? Where do we actually start? We thought the employee life cycle was probably the most fundamental point where we need to start. Um, I had some experience um, looking after the marketing department uh, in my career and, you know, I learnt quite a lot through them around, from a customer experience, around what they do with customers. So, you know, if you look at our wagering customers, our CRM and CI team can actually predict when a customer is about to leave the funnel through activity. So then they can then work out what right, what's the right message for that person based upon their um, betting trends to make sure we try and get them back. Is it a free offer? Is it taken to a event and vice versa? Also knowing about how to get them into the funnel and how to maintain them in the funnel. And I thought, well, that's a really novel idea. Why aren't we kind of applying the same sort of principle for around an employee? So I suppose the employee life cycle is where we really, I suppose, looked at that. We had um, used some technology in these processes, but it was very antiquated, like SurveyMonkey. Um, you know, it is digital, it is online. But again, it wasn't necessarily translating to what we were trying to look for. So we went and kind of looked at our whole employee life cycle and all the stages to understand how do we start influencing the employee experience. I suppose where Fuel 50 came in was probably more around the onboarding. So once we onboarded them, it was around how do you then create an experience for a new employee around the investment in them? And that might mean learning capability, career aspirations, talent path, and vice versa. So 
whilst Fuel50 was pretty fundamental in that place, we used a, a, a sort of a, a range of technology through that whole life cycle um, before, through onboarding, through um, pulse um, surveys, learning, which I'll talk about in a little bit more. But probably where Fuel50 has been fundamental for us um, is really about, well, the reason, oh, sorry, the reason why we looked at Fuel50 is that was the statistics we got about two years ago or, um, from an engagement survey. So just showed and highlighted just what employees thought about their leaders and their leaders' investment in their development. This was halfway through that privatisation discussion that was going on. And we had a performance review process um, that consistently sat on the bottom of the list of all the 30-odd engagement drivers. Something had to change. So the funny story was, was where do we start? Now I'd love to stand up here and tell you about how the, you know, the process and the, the, thought, the thought process and how we got to actually selecting the software, but unfortunately I can't help you with that. The funny story was is that um, two years ago, I got to leave good old Perth for my first ever interstate conference. I went to Sydney, came back here, and I think it was a HR thing, and Anne was talking, and the rest was history. That's purely what it was. I didn't know what technology, I wasn't, what, I wasn't even know if I was looking for that. What took my interest straight away was the user experience, because to me, visual always has an impact. Um, and I'm, as I was saying to Anne, I just told that story out in the, on the morning tea there, that, I mean, I heard about it, and I, was like, oh, I came back to the office and said, oh, look, I saw this really great platform, but I don't think we're going to be able to afford it, which we, we were, and obviously we've been in place now for a couple of years. The reason that we went for Fuel50 was it flipped the conversation around people's intrinsic motivators. We had a process, as you'd seen with the feedback, that was very focused on task, very focused on ticking boxes, very much talked about performance around what are you going to achieve in the next 12 months? And then we'll talk about how we're going to skill and develop you. What Fuel50 was able to do um, through the use of technology was actually, whilst it's a platform, it's what it changed around the conversations. So it changed the conversations from a top down to a bottom up, but it also gave the tools um, for leaders to be able to have conversations. Because I think sometimes we always believe that leaders have got the capability to have the conversations around what are your aspirations, have you considered this, when they don't have the answer to that, how to know the resources and know where to go to actually get those. So, so I can't help you around selecting software. We just went there. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to go with it. Um, but what we did learn when we implemented the last process, um, which we called development, it was called DPAs, Development Process Agreements, or a Planning Agreement, sorry, was that there were some pretty interesting lessons, I suppose, from that that we knew that we couldn't do again. So rather than being HR driven, we completely let the business drive it, so that's where our ambassador group came in. So we got leaders from each division, one from each division, and employees, a couple of employees from the other divisions as well, to start driving how we're going to actually build this new platform or new conversation in a business where it wasn't really liked. And I don't mean that wasn't just the last year, that was consistently the feedback we got. We knew we had to completely flip the conversation around. So we knew that we had to rely on others to help drive it. We were kind of like the puppet masters, as we like to be sometimes as HR, um, and help drive them to, to that sort of outcome. Um, it was important that we got leaders on board. They were the number one priority for us in the sense of if they didn't advocate it, then they weren't going to advocate it for their team. We've got about 60 leaders in our workforce, so it was pretty significant. I did a lot of work with the executive um, and said to them the importance, if they can't role model, then how can you ask your own managers if you can't do it yourself? So put that expectation back onto them. And through that, we kind of drove, um, and I'll show you what we, the approach we took. So we took a different approach around building, I suppose bringing the managers on um, along the path for us before we actually launched it. Being able to monitor and view and evaluate. So we kind of did small pieces as we kind of started to build it and kind of start launching bits and pieces to see was it hitting the mark, what wasn't working, to make sure that by the time we got to the point of when we went to the big launch, that we kind of had the right enge energy engagement for it, so that when we did launch it and onwards, that it was going to have a bit more of a success in the engagement with it as well, because there was always going to be cynicism, um, without doubt. Um, engaging stakeholders. <clears throat> so we decided to try a bit something a bit different. So we had to actually change, like I said, the conversation. Um, it was almost like removing Everyone's watched Harry Potter, I'm sure. Yep. So the name that could not be said, it was kind of like that same principle where the previous process cannot be named. <laughs> There's punishment for it. Um, I'd usually push-ups if I found some people, some burpees, I don't know, whatever we could find at the time. 
So we kind of, the approach was around how do we actually engage in a different way and sometimes through activation and through video you tend to find you have a different level of engagement with it. So I've got two videos to show you shortly. Um, the first one was around what we launched to the leadership group. So we took on that carpool karaoke kind of theme, made a bit of fun with it, um, but really tried to talk about how we want to change, I suppose, a dynamic around um, career aspirations and uh, talent and um, performance. And then the second one's around um, the launch. What was really cool is that we actually even got a drone into the warehouse just to kind of, so it was just trying to try on different ways of um, trying to get a different level of engagement. So bear with me for these. I think I'm good, Sheridan, just click the button. Thanks for coming in to do your DPA. Uh, yeah, okay. Sorry about this. Come in. Hey, stop. We don't do it like that anymore. Hmm? Haven't you heard about Fuel 50? Yeah. Come on, let's find out what drives you. So, what drives you? What do you mean? What I mean is, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What do you love doing? What are your values? Whoa. No one's ever asked me these sorts of questions before. Well, we are now. So what do you like doing at work? Um, I like to be super organised, so working with my team to help organise our campaigns is probably one of the main things. Okay, we need to know. Working nine to five. <laughs> we all work together and, you know, once all the jobs are done, you can see how the results and that's really good. That's good. So. Um, do you have sort of highs and lows where sometimes you're really busy and sometimes it's a bit quiet? Yeah, definitely. So it really just depends what we have going on at the time. Like yeah. at the moment we have our new brand campaign, so that's oh, okay. yeah, yeah. been something that we've been working through and it's really busy at the moment. But yeah, so depending what campaigns we have going on depends on how busy we are. And but which, which do you like best, the, the busy parts or the quiet parts? Um, I prefer the busy parts, just, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing worse than getting home at the end of the day and going, what did you do? It's just like, yeah, not yeah. much. Yeah. When it's busy, it makes the day go quick and, you know, You're right. things are stuff to do. Yeah. Getting back. Oh. <laughs> so what are your personal values? Um, I would say that I'm quite enthusiastic and optimistic towards work, so I think that really helps with the team environment, you know, if someone's enthusiastic about getting work yeah, done, yeah. it kind of builds a good vibe amongst everyone and um, we can all work together to get the job done. And I would say that I have like a good sense of humour. That's true. <laughs> That's... I bring like a lighthearted, fun nature to the team, so I think that's another really good thing because yeah. it makes work a bit more enjoyable. Yeah, I mean, nobody wants to come to work and all be super serious. No, definitely not. You've got to balance it because of course sometimes humour can go a bit far. I know myself, I get a bit carried away <laughs> sometimes. So true. <laughs> days, mate. I have been working like a dog. It's been a hard day's night. I should be sleeping like a log. Do you set goals for yourself? Yeah, I think it's really important to set goals so you can, you know, plan out your career. But I think sometimes when you're talking yeah. to your manager, you kind of forget, you know, your little victories and it would yeah. be a good yeah. thing if we could um, somehow record that we can catch our wins. I like that idea. I like that idea. That was good. It was really different. Yeah. So now do I need to go on the on track and put it in my DPA? No, 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 no. We got fuel 50 now. It's super easy. So yeah, it's something that was, we kind of tried to take a really um, interesting take on using some of the stuff that was going to be absorbed, utilised through when they started to use the platform and how we could actually put it into a conversation. Something that was relevant, carpool karaoke was obviously something quite a hit. Um, the gentleman that thing was part of the ambassador group, so we actually had 
um, individuals that were part of the group that actually um, wanted to actually be involved with it. And it just changed the dynamic for leaders to understand the importance of just having a conversation. That's all it was. It was a subtle thing um, that actually started to get a different level of engagement um, with the group. Um, the next one was our launch. So I hope that gave you a bit of an insight of something we tried. It was completely something we'd never done before at any of that sort of scale. But the engagement that we had as soon as they finished that session, that launch, and then actually went back to their desk. So we had some emails and some activations from there. So a significant sort of um, engagement, I suppose, in regards to something fairly new and fundamental for them, that they actually started to see the value of it. And the fact that we invested in that was pretty important. I'm just going to kind of quicken up because I know that uh, the wheat whip's taking a bit of my time. That's all right. Um, so moving forward, for what was really important for us was around the, the you know, the making sure that people are clear on how to use the platform. We had um, ambassadors around that could help them use it to ensure that, because it was something fairly new and different um, to what they'd seen before. And it's also making sure that they actually used the, um, uh, the fuel talents to really start driving the conversation around what are the things that engage people, individuals at work, and then how do we actually then start setting up a plan or a path for them that actually would see that there was actually... Um, quantifiable uh, um, investment into the individuals. The important thing too was something always return investment. I've got a CEO that's all about commercial decisions and financials of all experience for having CEOs, was around making sure that we could actually ensure that what we were doing actually had a benefit and not just a financial benefit. Um, that, that was kind of easy to kind of define. It was more about the qualitative, not just the um, quantitative. Um, it was pretty uh, influential for us in the sense that we'd always been seen as a fast follower, um, whereas um, starting with Fuel50, we even got a chance to use some of the technology for the first time. Fuel Perform, we were the first organisation to use it in the world. So it was a great sort of story for us um, to be able to sell to our organisation around. We actually are no longer that sort of fast follower. We're actually starting to lead around some of the things that are around your investment and your development, which was really pleasing. It definitely changed the conversation. Some of the qualitative stuff I'll go through very quickly is around the conversations, a bit like the video, um, that they've never had conversations with their leaders before. Um, and what Fuel50 was able to do was create almost the platform for them or the, the, the resources and the tools to actually start having conversations that we probably all think are just natural for us to do. And we kind of sometimes presume that all leaders are capable. Um, the reality is, is that you've only got to see the scores that we set up there for engagement scores before that suggested that that wasn't actually happening. Well, that was quite a relevant. It's many short races after they hit each other. So um, just high level um, results. So you saw the changes where we kind of stood from um, before Fuel 50 came on board. We had some pretty significant um, improvement, as you can see. So 35% to 92 from an activation perspective, 38 to 74% um, percent in regards to actually using the roadmap. And that's something we've um, been able to sustain over a period of time. 
Um, again, like I said, the qualitative thing was probably more beneficial for us because that's where you actually get the traction in the conversations, the storytellings that leaders have with their employees or the employees vice versa having with their leaders. And um, we were fortunate to win our first award um, with some of the video clips as you would have seen. So that was quite nice, again, in regarding employee branding, but also from an investment in our employees that we we're actually doing some things that actually were recognised beyond our own um, organisation. So that was kind of the activation of Jan uh, 2019. So yep, um, I think most organisations would be pretty happy with um, some of those sort of results. What's been more pleasing is that um, effectively October, we're similarly pretty much sitting similar to the same sort of um, result. So it's had sustainability, which is really important. The thing is always when you implement new stuff, it's kind of like that shiny toy at the start. How do you keep actually ensuring that it actually is not just a one, thing, one, one, month, one moment wonder through to something that's actually transferable and um, embedded within the organisation? So we had some really great um, results to far. I mentioned this more from, I think, um, I'm talking from my own personal experience. So sometimes I think we have the tall poppy syndrome in Australia that really does not allow, especially HR practitioners, to actually get out there and promote themselves in some way. Um, we don't typically put ourselves up for awards. It's something we thought we'd give it a try to, and it's been really positive received. Obviously, um, we have been recognised for finals for one and um, finals next week at the ARI Awards. What it does, though, from a business perspective, it actually shows that small players like us can actually influence in a positive way and always rely on the bigger organisations that we always think we should be aspiring to. So that's been really positive for employee branding perspective, and especially for the HR team with the work that they've done. Um, so Fuel50 was kind of the, the first integral piece for us around that digital ecosystem. And having seen the benefit from that particular piece of work, we've then looked around how else can we use it when you think about that employee life cycle. So, um, like I said, sometimes the challenge is how do you use intricate pieces of technology and still make sure that they're seamless from a user experience. That's always a challenge. We knew that we couldn't go to one platform. It wouldn't work. When I had gone out and looked at sort of technology, I always found that some stuff out of some programs would be really good and be, the rest would be really average and you kind of go, it's not going to meet it. These days with single sign-on and those things, it takes away that feeling like you're going into five different sort of um, programs. So we invested quite a bit and I don't mean money, but in, in looking at the tools that would best get us there. So onboarding was pretty critical when you think about an employee experience, it's their first experience. Um, we had reasonably good already onboarding statistics, but even just in um, employing it like in border, it had a significant change. Subtle things like um, uh, they're asked a question as part of their onboarding around, you know, what's their three o'clock munchie? So on their first day, we make sure that if they said twisties, twisties is sitting on their desk at three o'clock. Now that might seem like something really, well, so what? But it's amazing what the experience is for an individual that's not gone through that. So subtle things like that have actually gone around and they go back and talk about going, wow, I've got a pack of twisties on my desk, three o'clock or my manager took me out to lunch. So it's about how that we've used that process to actually engage them right from the start. And again, some qualitative feedback. You know, we've talked about the learning side. So um, we, I think um, LinkedIn tried for three years to get me onto the LinkedIn learning kind of um, aspect and it was hard because again, we don't have a culture of learning in our organisation. It's funny, I always find it's a bit of a contradiction. You want the way the business organise, uh, way uh, you know, technology is driving us, it's always about in the moment right now, whereas sometimes to create a culture, you always have to set up something standardised and traditional around you'll do learning here and here, which kind of then goes against the, the, the sort of the self-driven nature. So we've had to kind of play different ways, but again, how do we use these sorts of technologies um, to actually enhance the employee experience in the ways that we worked? was quite um, significant, especially the LinkedIn learning, where we've actually started to see a significant uplift in, um, I suppose, particular learnings, whether it's um, bite size, whether it's particular modules, and it kind of then taps back into the Fuel 50 for us around some of the skill sets that were identified. We can now, um, and we only do this for about 100 employees, we don't do it for everybody, so we have high engagement because these guys want to use it. Rather than going, here's it all to leaders, and what do you reckon, how many do you reckon leaders picked it up? 50%, if we're lucky. So we thought, we want to give it to people that actually want to use it. Remember that our scenario is, is that we're under privatisation. People are uncertain about what their career aspirations are. Our value proposition was around, we have to ensure we do the right thing by our people, even though we don't know whether we actually get sold or not. We think we probably will, but we don't know. So whether that's around the new business that's left after we are privatised or their future aspiration in another role, if we can at least have that legacy left behind where we've seen, been seen to do the right thing by employees around developing them, and that's all we can control. Um, so this is one of the strategies that we used in regards to trying to drive a bit more of a learning culture. 
Hyphen um, was really interesting for us. That was actually our first piece of technology. They're a Silicon Valley um, pulse um, survey. Back then, about four or five years ago, they'd never, we'd never um, used this type of tool. I couldn't find anything on the Australian market. There's always a bit of a benefit when you go to a, that I actually thought would work. Um, when you go to a new provider that's never entered the Australian market, you can have a bit of leverage around um, the sort of package that you have. And they're pretty progressive in again, sort of keeping building, I suppose, technology that actually uh, meets the client needs. But this was pretty fundamental for us in the sense that what we were able to do with the challenges we had around uncertainty and privatisation, we could use this tool. So each week there is a question that's going out. Some will be engagement driven, some will be fun. So you can see the caravan on the side there. We lost our coffee shop that was in our area that closed down. Um, what we created was we actually subsidised coffee, so they pay $1.50. We've got the caravan guy to come in and make coffees. And what it's created from a collaboration perspective, everyone hangs around the coffee machine, uh, the van out the front of the building, goes back into the office rather than spending 15 minutes to walking around to the nearest coffee shop. But the conversations that have started have just been so enriching and has built a different sort of culture. It's just been um, really interesting. We have things like ask the CEO, so they can ask any question of the CEO. We do ask the exec, we sit in the boardroom, they can ask us any questions and we're there live answering questions. We'd rather know about the questions under uncertainty rather than trying to guess what's being said at the water cooler because we can then less address it. Um, it's definitely transformed the ways that HR's worked. We're a lot more agile and nimble. Um, our focus now is purely on that life cycle and how we make sure that that experience is meaningful, purposeful um, and intrinsic to what drives an individual in their workplace. Um, and our role is to basically remove any roadblocks. That's our focus. Um, I'm not saying all the other stuff doesn't, isn't important, but through that cycle we've now really driven um, efficiencies, but also value adding into the areas that we were typically sometimes a challenging or a bad experience for individuals both ends. So in summary, um, lessons learned. For us it was about small steps. Um, we'd had previous experiences before where it wasn't well, so there's always the apprehension going, there's going to be another donkey that I'm going to have to recover from and explain why we went there again. Um, applying the right technology, sometimes it's like the, the experience I had with the Anne is like, that's just, like it just, it resonated with me. Sometimes you've got to be a bit more diligent and actually kind of ask the right questions, pretty simplistic. Um, removing the road bumps was the critical thing for us in the sense of when you use technology, how do you do it in a way that actually you get the value out of it and maximise the value of it. And it's always about linking it back to business strategy. The one thing I'd say that we were fortunate in our organisation was, and I hope to think that I've contributed in some way to it, was that typically when you go through change like privatisation, businesses actually then cut stuff. Usually it's learning development and all those types of things. We understood the importance of it. I didn't have to convince the exec too hard. We've actually done the opposite and actually put more investment into that space. Because at the end of the day, we only achieve things through our people at the end of the day. So for us, it was about how do you keep looking back to those three pillars, employee experience, ways of working, um, and employee experience. So as you can see, it's not so old school anymore in regards to our journey around how we've used technology. And thank you very much for your time.